what is Lima syndrome? Welcome to Insane History. I'm Professor Graham Yorston, neuropsychiatrist, and in this video, I'll be answering that very question. Lima syndrome is a psychological phenomenon in which terrorists or kidnappers who have taken people hostage start to develop feelings of sympathy for their captives. It is the opposite or inversion of the better known Stockholm syndrome in which hostages come to identify with their captors, sympathizing with them, coming to their defense or even joining their cause, as was the case with its most famous victim, Patty Hearst. Most sources suggest that Lima syndrome takes its name from a hostage crisis in Lima, Peru in 1996, involving the Movimiento Revolucionario Tupac Amaru, or MRTA, a Marxist-Leninist revolutionary movement dedicated to establishing a socialist state and ridding Peru of all imperialist elements. It was named after Tupac Amaru II, who led a major rebellion against Spanish rule in Peru in 1780 and became a mythical figure in the Peruvian struggle for independence and indigenous rights movements around the world. In turn, the 18th century Tupac claimed descent from the last Sapa Inca, or Emperor of the Incas, brutally executed by the Spanish 200 years earlier in 1572. In December 1996, 14 members of the MRTA took control of the Japanese ambassador's residence in Peru at which more than 600 guests were attending a party in honour of Emperor Akihito's birthday. As you would expect, the guest list included high-profile politicians, business people, diplomats and academics, as well as the Japanese mother of the then-president Alberto Fujimura. Although the siege dragged on for a total of 126 days, within a few days the MRTA decided to set free most of their hostages, including the president's mother and they continued to release further hostages at intervals, so that by the end they were left with just 72, mainly senior government officials and leaders of Peru's security forces. Those released said the hostage takers were a group of young men and women, 18 to 20 years old, who wanted to live, not die, and they urged the president to negotiate a settlement. President Fujimura did enter into discussions about the MRTA demands of releasing prisoners and economic reform. But all the while, a unit of special forces was in training and tunnels were being dug under the residence in preparation for Operation Chavin de Juantar, named after a pre-Inca archaeological site famous for its underground passageways. While these negotiations were going on, the hostages opened their own dialogues with the MRTA rebels, listening to their ideas on the future of Peru and asking them to allow physicians to enter the building to provide medical care and supplies. They also persuaded their captors to allow food and clothing, reading material and games to be brought in by the Red Cross. The hostages were even allowed to write brief messages to their families. This paper analyzes the crisis using relational development theory, originally developed as a way of understanding the phases couples go through in establishing relationships. The authors suggest that for the entire four months of the siege, the captors and their hostages were in the coming together phase, characterized by building trust and exchanging information. I have to say, it seemed odd to think of this in terms of a mutual consenting relationship. There was no mutuality here. The captors were armed to the teeth and part of an organisation that routinely murdered people to further their own ends. And whilst the captives may have been going through the motions of listening and sympathising with the MRTA, they were receiving microphones and video cameras concealed in books, chessboards and water bottles, and even a radio hidden in a guitar. It seems more likely to me that they were playing their young, idealistic captors along right from the beginning. They knew that governments couldn't be seen to give in to terrorists and that it was always going to end in violence. And violent it was. On the 22nd of April 1997, at 23 minutes past three in the afternoon, a time when they knew that eight of the 14 rebels were in the habit of playing indoor football for an hour, a team of 140 Peruvian commandos blasted their way into the fortified residence, 
taking out the floor of the room where they were playing football, instantly killing several MRTA men. Simultaneous assaults on the main door and backyard allowed all of the hostages to escape, apart from one, a member of the Supreme Court who had pre-existing health problems and died of a heart attack. The rebels, however, weren't so lucky. All 14 were killed. The operation was hailed a complete success and President Fujimura praised for his decisive action. At first, anyway. It later emerged, however, that some of the rebels had been shot in the back of the head, and critics have said that right from the outset, the orders were that no rebel would get out alive. This is generally taken as the first example of the Lima Syndrome, and as a survival tactic, it would make sense to try to humanise yourself with your captors by listening to them and asking for small concessions, acknowledging their power and your vulnerability. But the term was actually applied to a much smaller scale hostage situation in Lima that played out six months before this. This one involved 71-year-old psychiatrist Mariano Querol, a well-known figure in Peru as he often appeared in the media to give his opinion on the problems of Peruvian society. A comfortable but not a wealthy man. He was abducted by a local businessman, Gonzalo Igueras, a neighbour of one of Querol's children whose taxi company was struggling and who needed money to pay off his debts and children's school fees. Igueras demanded a ransom of $150,000, or else. Such things were common in Peru. There had been at least 70 similar kidnappings in the previous six months, and Dr. Querol knew that these amateur affairs often ended badly. After two days of sheer terror and believing he was going to die, he decided his best chance of survival was to try to befriend his captors. So he told them he did aerobics every morning and asked them to tune the radio to dance music and salsa'd as if his life depended on it, much to their amusement. This is a clip from a film he made later called The Dancer and the Psychiatrist. He also asked for some books to read and a special diet. Nothing too complicated, just a few more vegetables. He chatted and watched TV with his captors in the tiny room where he was held for 18 days. Together, they read Gabriel Garcia Marquez's latest book, News of a Kidnapping, and enjoyed comparing the fictional novel with the reality of their situation. He said, My keepers didn't know who I was at first, but when they saw that the press was giving me so much attention, one of them said, We're making history! His family eventually paid the ransom and he was released, his captors even giving him some small change to get a taxi home. They didn't get away with it and were soon caught, but Querol, showing the depth of his humanity, asked the courts to be lenient as his kidnappers had never been violent towards him. Staying calm and befriending his captors, forcing them to see him as a person may well have saved his life. He wrote a book about his experience and about how, having come through such a terrible ordeal, he was living life with renewed passion, because hell was behind him. Like other hostage syndromes, Lima syndrome is not a medical condition. It is not a recognised psychiatric diagnosis, but a behaviour observed in some people in highly emotionally charged situations. I think we can learn from Carol, though, that dwelling on past traumas and things that have not gone well brings us no joy, but being grateful for having come through ordeals just might. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to hear more about how hostages can react psychologically, please check out my other videos on Stockholm Syndrome, Lima Syndrome, London Syndrome, and the purely fictional Helsinki Syndrome. And remember to subscribe and click for notifications if you haven't already done so to be kept up to date with my other videos on the fascinating history of mental health. See you again soon.